Hello, everybody. Today we're going to be responding to a few of well, what I would call popular misconceptions that some Christian apologists have about two ancient historians, Phlegon and Thallus. These writers frequently appear in lists of non-Christian sources for Jesus' life, and for instance, we can see them here in this popular internet meme. Notice what it claims. According to the meme, Phlegon tells us that Jesus predicted the future, rose after death, and showed signs of crucifixion. And then it has Thallus telling us that Jesus lived, was crucified, and that there was darkness and an earthquake. Or, to give another example, here's a Christian apologist by the name of Grant R. Jeffries, who claims that Phlegon and Thallus both independently recorded the supernatural darkness about the crucifixion. Thallus in particular has proved especially popular among Christians because, according to apologists like Christopher Scott, Thallus wrote in AD 52, and so this can be very impressive to Christians who believe it. For instance, the apologist John Oakes has this to say, quote, It proves that the darkness was openly claimed and believed by Christians less than 20 years after the event. Or, here's an excerpt from the book Cold Case Christianity by the apologist J. Warner Wallace, where he makes it sound like Thallus wrote a lengthy narrative of Jesus' passion. In his words, quote, Thallus chronicled the crucifixion of Jesus, unquote. And we get an even more dramatic picture from Kelly Walters, another Christian apologist. He writes, quote, Thallus's ancient writings have also served to both confirm and testify accurately and truthfully to many other historical details and content at that time in history that the Bible also documents. And yeah, I mean, that is really impressive if it's true, but as you can probably tell from my tone of voice, I don't think it is. But it's an interesting question, I think, to ask, why are Christians repeating these misconceptions? And as we'll see shortly, it's not just Christian apologists. Even professional historians can and do make mistakes when it comes to some of this stuff. So to see what it is that I'm talking about, let's start digging into this history. Just who was Thallus anyway? The classicist Benjamin Garstad provides a helpful summary, quote, Thallus wrote in Greek. His histories were divided into three books covering the period from the fall of Troy until the 167th Olympiad, that's from 112 to 109 BC, although a later end date is possible. The histories seem to have been written as a universal chronicle organized by Olympiads." Unquote. Oh, and by the way, I want to interject here real quick. As many of you may already know, ancient writers didn't have our modern calendar system, and so they used alternative methods of keeping track of the years. One of the ways they did this is by counting what are called Olympiads. That's what Benjamin Garstad is talking about here. And as historians Thomas Harrison and Edward Bisfam explain, these are four-year periods between Olympic festivals. So by counting these Olympiads, this was one way that ancient chronographers established an internationally recognized dating system. Anyway, getting back to Thallus, Benjamin Garstad continues, quote, In the Latin tradition, Thallus had a reputation as a euhemeristic historian, and in the Greek East, he was known as a chronographer of Oriental events, unquote. Sadly, we don't actually have any of Thallus's books. Dale Allison, a New Testament scholar and historian of early Christianity, summarizes the situation, quote, Thallus's history has perished. We know it only through references in later writers. Among them is George Sinkellis, unquote. Well, okay, so then who is this George Sinkellis? Well, the classicist Daniel Thornton helpfully provides an overview, quote, Sinkellis was a title which, in the early church, was given to those monks or clerics who shared quarters with their bishops and were often presumed to succeed the bishop at his death. George the Sincellus served under the Patriarch Tarasius from 784 to 806 CE, but he didn't follow the usual path and succeed Tarasius upon the Patriarch's death. Instead, he retired to a monastery, whereupon he composed the work which was to be his claim to fame, the Selection of Chronography." Unquote. 
And by the way, this book by Sinkellus, The Selection of Chronography, has proved invaluable to historians. Let's hear Religious Studies professor William Adler and Classics lecturer Paul Tuffin tell us a bit about its rediscovery. Quote, when a copy of Sinkellus's chronicle was first made known in Europe in the 16th century, scholars immediately recognized the value of his work as a witness to ancient source material, at the time either entirely unknown or poorly attested elsewhere. This was especially true of the earlier part of Sinkellus's chronicle, a segment of the work marked by copious citations from Babylonian and Egyptian antiquities, and various Jewish extra-biblical sources from the time of the Second Temple. Sinkellus's chronicle also proved to be an invaluable guide in reconstructing the origins and development of Christian chronography. Much of Sinkellus's work is devoted to the exposition and critique of his predecessors, chief among them Julius Africanus, who lived circa 160 to 240, unquote. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. But now we'll want to ask, who is Julius Africanus? The retired Byzantine studies professor Andrew Luth summarizes, quote, Julius Africanus is one of the pre-Nicene Christian authors about whom we would dearly love to know more. He had connections with Clement and Origen and also with Jerusalem, and he traveled throughout the early Christian world, unquote. And just like Thallus did, Julius Africanus also wrote a chronography, but unfortunately it too has been lost. However, we do have some ancient comments about it, as well as a few direct quotations. And on this basis, the historian Christopher Kelly gives his assessment, quote, Around 221 in Alexandria, Africanus completed a universal chronology that ran in five books, from the expulsion of Adam from Paradise through to the Incarnation, before offering a rapid survey of events up to the time of Emperor Macrinus. It seems that his main working method was to match the biblical narrative with corresponding events in Greek or Persian history. Africanus aimed to demonstrate the antiquity of the Old Testament patriarchs and, most importantly, to reveal a pattern in the biblical past since the fall that might permit an educated guess at the time of the second coming of Christ and the end of the world." Unquote. Well, so now that we've been introduced to Julius Africanus, let's go ahead and see what he has to say. The context here is that he's discussing the supernatural darkness at the crucifixion of Jesus. And so he writes, quote, In the third book of his histories, Thalos dismisses this darkness as a solar eclipse. In my opinion, this is nonsense. How could one believe that an eclipse took place when the moon was almost in opposition to the sun? Unquote. Oh, and by the way, Africanus is quite correct about that last bit. A solar eclipse could not have happened at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, at least not assuming that the Gospels are correct that it took place around the Passover. John M. Steele, an historian of the exact sciences in antiquity, points out that, quote, since the Passion took place at the Jewish Passover, this should have been on or around the full moon, in which case a solar eclipse would not be possible, unquote. But anyway, turning back to Africanus, notice that he doesn't actually quote Thallus verbatim, and the way he paraphrases Thallus is somewhat ambiguous. As New Testament professor Carl Holliday explains, quote, It's not clear from the text whether this darkness of the crucifixion story is mentioned by Thallus, or whether he merely mentions an eclipse which Africanus has connected with the gospel story, unquote. In particular, we know from astronomical tables that there was an eclipse in the year 29, and Thallus may simply be referring to that. The late classicist and philologist Felix Jacobi gives the same assessment, quote, For Thallos, there's nothing more than that he, like Phlegon, noted the solar eclipse of November 24th of the year 29 CE, unquote. So this is an interesting possibility, but is there any evidence to support it? Is there any evidence to support the notion that Thallus only mentioned a solar eclipse and that it was Africanus who made the connection to Jesus' crucifixion? Well, yes and no. Let me explain what I mean. It's possible that we do have Thallus' very own words on this eclipse. 
The 4th century church historian Eusebius, in his own chronicle, yes, everybody was writing chronographies or chronicles, uh, Eusebius cites an unnamed Greek historian as writing, quote, There was a solar eclipse. Bithynia was shaken by an earthquake. Many sites in Nicaea collapsed, unquote. Now, compare that to Africanus's description in the context where he mentions Thallus. I've arranged the quotations side by side so that we can see the parallels. Quote, A most terrible darkness fell over all the world. The rocks were torn apart by an earthquake, and many places both in Judea and the rest of the world were thrown down. Unquote. The similarities between these passages are obvious, and as early as the 17th century, we find the Dutch theologian Hugo Grotius speculating that, quote, This writer, not named by Eusebius, without doubt is Thallus, unquote. The late Robert Grant, a professor of early Christianity, echoed this possibility, quote, The references to solar eclipse, Bithynian earthquake, and the collapse of buildings in Nicaea, cited by Eusebius without reference to author, may come from him, unquote. That is to say, from Thallus. If this suggestion is correct, it would mean that Thallus never mentioned the crucifixion at all, but only natural phenomena which Africanus mistakenly connected to the gospel stories. The problem is, though, that we can only conjecture, and what appears to be the case to one scholar may not appear that way to another. For instance, the 18th century English theologian Nathaniel Lardner gives his opinion, quote, Many learned men think that Eusebius refers to Thallus as well as Phlegon. To me, it appears exceedingly manifest that Eusebius speaks of one writer only, meaning Phlegon, unquote. In other words, not Thallus. Okay, so I think this is a good time to give Phlegon his due introduction. The historian of ancient Greece, Paul Christensen, has this to say, quote, Phlegon, originally from Tralles in Asia Minor, was a freedman of Hadrian and worked in the imperial household, unquote. But unfortunately, Phlegon isn't very well known among historians. The classical philologist Julia Dorosuska explains, quote, Phlegon, as well as his writings, have for many years garnered limited attention of scholars. This is largely due to the fact that Phlegon was regarded as a rather mediocre writer, and his output was considered derivative and secondary, unquote. And we're about to see a couple of reasons of why Phlegon's writings aren't very well regarded. Classical studies professor William Hansen explains, quote, Phlegon authored several books, of which the most remarkable is his Book of Marvels, a compilation of wondrous events and facts. A sample of its themes will give a fair idea of its nature. A dead girl carries on an affair. A father eats his own son. A maiden changes sex from female to male on her wedding day. A child is born with the head of the Egyptian god Anubis. A live centaur is captured. Girls in a certain city give birth at seven years of age. Bones of giant beings are discovered. And so on." Unquote. Obviously, it's not exactly ideal to be depending on this kind of an author for historical information, although just speaking for myself, I have to wonder, if we were to collect a similar list of marvels drawn from the canonical gospels, how would that collection stack up to Phlegon's? Well, uh, never mind, I guess. As for Phlegon's historical value, or lack thereof, the Greco-Roman historian Joseph B. Scholten quips, quote, Fantastic tales such as those collected by Phlegon are admittedly the historiographic equivalent of cotton candy. Both look fairly substantial, but contain little reliable information or nutrition, unquote. However, we're more interested in another book by Phlegon. According to Paul Christensen, quote, Phlegon wrote an Olympiad chronicle, yeah, there's another chronicle for us, uh, in 15 or 16 books with the title Collection of Olympic Victors and Chronological Matters, unquote. William Hansen describes what we know about its contents, quote, Only small pieces survive which are sufficient to reveal its plan and format. For each Olympiad, Phlegon gives the names of the Olympic victors and the competitions in which they were victorious, as well as notable non-athletic events of the period, natural phenomena, omens, religious matters, and the like." Unquote. 
So now that we know a little bit about who Phlegon is, I think we're ready to go ahead and look at where the 4th century historian Eusebius gives the words of Phlegon. Quote, In the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, there was an eclipse of the sun greater than any that had been previously known. And night fell at the sixth hour of the day, so that the stars appeared in the sky. A great earthquake occurring throughout Bithynia overturned many sites in Nicaea. Unquote. Now, the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad corresponds to the year 33 CE. However, that figure may not be correct, as the 6th century grammarian John Philoponus claims that Phlegon reported a different year. John M. Steele has this to say about it, quote, The preserved sources for Phlegon's eclipse contained discrepancies in the year in which the eclipse was supposed to take place. Philipponus gave the second year, whereas Eusebius gave the fourth year. Furthermore, calculation of the solar eclipses that would have been visible showed that the eclipse must have taken place during the first year." Unquote. Professor Steele is referring again to the eclipse of the year 29 CE, and people have known for several centuries that's the eclipse Phlegon is most likely referring to. There are a couple of pretty good reasons for this. First and foremost, as John Steele alluded to, there wasn't any solar eclipse visible anywhere near Phlegon in the period between 30 and 33 CE. And secondly, the eclipse of 29 CE was visible in Bithynia and Nicaea, precisely the two places Phlegon mentions in connection with it. The late historian of ancient astronomy J.K. Fotheringham explains the situation, quote, that there was no eclipse in 33 corresponding to Phlegon's description is certain, but the easiest correction is to suppose that Phlegon refers to the eclipse of the sun of November 24, 29 AD, which was total in Nicaea and Bithynia." Unquote. And so it looks like Phlegon is not discussing Jesus in this part of his chronicle. As Dale Allison puts it, quote, there's really no reason to associate Phlegon's eclipse with Jewish history, much less with Jesus, unquote. That being said, Phlegon actually did respond to some early Christian traditions in another part of his chronicle. And we know this because in the 3rd century, the Christian writer Origen of Alexandria discussed what Phlegon said about Jesus, quote, Phlegon thinks that while he was alive, he didn't help himself. But after death, Jesus rose again and showed the marks of his punishment and how his hands had been pierced." Unquote. Unfortunately, it's not clear from this passage whether Phlegon only said that Jesus didn't help himself, or whether he also said that Jesus rose from the dead, complete with crucifixion marks. Just speaking for myself, though, if Phlegon thought a dead girl could carry on an affair, well, then I guess it's not too much of a stretch to think that he might also believe a story about Jesus' resurrection. Anyway, Origen also has this to say, quote, Phlegon even grants to Christ foreknowledge of certain future events, although he was muddled and said that some things which really happened to Peter happened to Jesus, unquote. So it looks like Phlegon was responding to the Christian traditions circulating in his day, and he may have even had access to one or more of the canonical Gospels. For instance, this is the view of the religious studies professor John Granger Cook. In Cook's opinion, quote, Origen clearly assumes Phlegon knew one of the Gospels, unquote. Now, I don't know if I agree with Cook that this is clear, but it's certainly a plausible hypothesis. In any case, since Phlegon flourished in the second century when some of the Gospels were circulating, it's impossible to rule out that he might have read them. So we had to talk a bit about Phlegon, not just because he's interesting in his own right, but also because he's going to be important in interpreting Julius Africanus. In the very same passage, quoted by George Sinkelis that we saw a few minutes ago, Africanus apparently has this to say as well, quote, Phlegon records that during the reign of Tiberius Caesar there was a complete solar eclipse at full moon from the sixth to ninth hour. It is clear that this is the one, unquote. That is to say, the supernatural darkness at Jesus' crucifixion. But this comment attributed to Africanus doesn't actually make a lot of sense, and so it raises some potential doubts about the general reliability of the entire Africanus passage. 
William Adler and Paul Tuffin, in their commentary, describe some of the problems, and they don't mince words. Quote, This sentence is full of inconsistencies. It's hard to imagine why, after previously discounting the solar eclipse explanation, Africanus suddenly embraces Phlegon's eclipse as clearly the same one described in Matthew. Phlegon's dating of the eclipse is also at odds with Africanus' own chronology of Jesus' ministry. Unquote. Making matters worse is that Eusebius quoted Phlegon directly, and so we can see for ourselves that Phlegon doesn't say anything about the eclipse lasting for three hours or occurring at the time of a full moon. As Adler and Tuffin put it, quote, the description of the eclipse that Africanus ascribes to Phlegon conflicts with Eusebius's. There's no suggestion here about a three-hour solar eclipse at full moon, unquote. Incidentally, Origen of Alexandria noticed that last bit, too. He says, quote, Phlegon indeed in his chronicles did state that an eclipse occurred in the reign of Tiberius Caesar, but he did not inform us that it occurred when the moon was full, unquote. Due to these inconsistencies, scholars suspect that the reference to Phlegon in Africanus could be an interpolation, maybe by George Sinkelis himself. This was, for instance, the opinion of the late classical scholar Martin Ruth, quote, Africanus seems to have mingled his words with those of Phlegon. I would say that all this is an addition to the testimony of Phlegon by George Sinkelis or by someone else." Unquote. Whether Africanus's text has been tampered with, as Ruth suggested, or whether Africanus was just plain incorrect about what Phlegon wrote, something's definitely amiss here. And this just underscores the kind of things that can go wrong when we don't actually have the words of an ancient author himself, but only an ambiguous reference by another author who is in turn quoted by a third author. As Nathaniel Lardner reminds us, quote, it often happens that in collections of that kind, we don't find so much accuracy as might be wished, unquote. Even so, there are still some scholars who are convinced that Thallus really was writing about the crucifixion darkness. Carl Holliday explains the argument. He says that Thallus, quote, isn't cited by Christian authors as an independent pagan witness to the eclipse. He is rather censured for seeing it merely as a natural phenomenon. From this, it has been deduced that he knew the gospel tradition, but in keeping with his euhemeristic outlook, interpreted it rationalistically, unquote. And although Carl Holliday himself isn't persuaded by this line of reasoning, some historians are. For instance, Benjamin Garstad insists, quote, the text is sufficiently clear that Thallus wrote of the crucifixion, unquote. Personally, I don't share Garstad's confidence, but he could very well be correct. It's quite possible that George Sinkelis is accurately quoting this part of Africanus, that Garstad's interpretation of Africanus is the right one, and that Africanus in turn was accurately interpreting what Thallus wrote. But even if all this is true, then the next thing to notice is that Thallus would be responding to Christian claims, not reporting some kind of first-hand knowledge of the crucifixion, or even of an eclipse. The retired professor of New Testament Robert Van Voorst puts it this way, quote, Since Thallus seems to be refuting a Christian argument, he likely knew about this darkness at the death of Jesus from Christians, not from an independent source, unquote. In other words, Thallus wouldn't be confirming the historicity of the crucifixion darkness, but only confirming that Christians had told that particular story by Thallus' own day. Ah, ah, but wait a second. If Thallus was writing in 52 CE, as Christian apologists like Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel claim, then that's still pretty significant. Dale Allison explains, quote, if Thallus wrote in the 50s of the first century, then he would be both the earliest non-Christian witness to Jesus and the earliest witness to the tradition that a darkness coincided with the crucifixion. Although this hardly entails the historicity of such an event, it would establish a pre markan origin for the story." Unquote. Well, okay, so then what is going on with this dating to the 50s, and why do Christian apologists keep repeating that specific year of 52 CE? Unfortunately, the issue is a little bit complicated, and so we're going to have to lay out some background first. 
Benjamin Garstad summarizes the situation, quote, We have in Eusebius's chronicle a testimonium to the period covered by Thallus's histories. As Eusebius puts it, from the fall of Troy to the 167th Olympiad, that's again from 112 to 109 BC. Two of the fragments of Thallus, however, fall outside of this supposed coverage. Belus, according to Thallus himself, lived 322 years before the Trojan War, and the crucifixion occurred more than 100 years after the 167th Olympiad. Several scholars have, therefore, considered the text of this passage, that's the passage in Eusebius, to be corrupt, unquote. And so, for example, we find Robert Van Voorst making this kind of argument, quote, One possible solution is to argue that the report we have in the Armenian fragments of Eusebius's chronicle is wrong. Karl Müller amends the likely reading of the lost Greek original from the 167th Olympiad to the 207th Olympiad in 49 to 52 CE, unquote. Ah, okay, okay, there's that year, 52 CE, that the apologists are talking about. But notice the problems here. First of all, even if Thallus did end his chronicle in the year 52, that doesn't mean he wrote it that year. And more importantly, the text of Eusebius as we have it doesn't say that. Instead, it gives a completely different Olympiad corresponding to the 2nd century BCE. And it's only a scholarly hypothesis that maybe the text had been corrupted before it was translated into Armenian. This suggestion goes back to a 19th century classical philologist by the name of Karl Müller. He thought that maybe the Greek text originally read Sigma Zeta, that's 207, but that scribes accidentally inserted an extra letter T, and then maybe on a separate occasion changed the Sigma to a Rho, producing the 167 that we have in our text of Josephus today. Okay, but why would Mueller think that's what happened? Well, here's what he himself had to say about it. Quote, Thallus wrote before Josephus. If you grant this, it's not so improbable that our Thallus was freed by Tiberius, which Josephus mentions. Unquote. Since Tiberius reigned from 14 to 37 CE, that led the biblical scholar Maurice Gogol to speculate further. In 1932, he wrote this, quote, we conjecture that he may have lived some 15 or 20 years after the master who had set him free. As there is no reason to think that Thallus would have waited until the last months of his life to write his chronicle, it would seem that it may have been written during the middle of the first century of our era." Unquote. Now, personally, I don't agree with Mueller or with Gogol, and we'll see very shortly that neither do a number of professional historians, but at least they acknowledged that their conjectures are just that. Conjectures. Unfortunately, not every scholar is as responsible as Mueller and Gogol. For instance, you can see here on this next slide that by 1950, the evangelical biblical scholar F.F. F. Bruce was stating, without argument, without qualification, and without even so much as a reference, that Thallus was, in fact, a freedman of the emperor Tiberius, and that he wrote about the crucifixion precisely in the year A.D. 52. And you know what? It's understandable why he might not want to mention that stuff as we're going to continue to see almost every link in this remarkable chain of claims and conjectures has been opposed by historians of one stripe or another. We've already seen that Thallus may not have mentioned the crucifixion at all, which is fully consistent with the endpoint of the 167th Olympiad given by the text of Eusebius as we actually have it. Another possibility is that Thallus's authentic chronicle originally ended at the 167th Olympiad, but was later expanded. Now, I'm not personally convinced of this, but I'll go ahead and let the British archaeologist Nikos Kokinos speak for this view. Quote, Thallus's work must have been extended by a Christian pseudo-Thallus to shortly before AD 180. Pseudo-Thallus inserted the interpretation of the darkness at the crucifixion. 
The real Thallus was apparently older than Castor, and thus his last mentioned Olympiad may well have been the 167th, exactly as found in Eusebius." Unquote. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering who Castor is, that's Castor of Rhodes. He was another chronicler uh, whose writings are sometimes dated to the first century BCE. But anyway, even if Thallus really did mention the crucifixion, it hardly follows that Eusebius' text is corrupt. As Benjamin Garstad explains, quote, In this case, the treatment of the darkness at the crucifixion must be considered part of a digression on matters out with the proper chronological purview of the histories, perhaps diverging from some notice on an eclipse, unquote. In other words, Thallus may have only mentioned the crucifixion as an aside, and not part of the main body of his history. But if we do assume that Eusebius' text is incorrect or corrupted in that place, then Mueller's emendation to the 207th Olympiad is still only a conjecture. Nikos Kokinos calls it totally arbitrary, or as Garstad puts it, quote, if we agree that the text is corrupt, practically any date between AD 30 and AD 180 is acceptable, unquote. Hmm, yeah, but wait a second. Didn't we hear from Mueller just a moment ago that Josephus supposedly knew about Thallus's writings? And since Josephus is thought to have died around the year 100, that means Thallus couldn't have written anywhere near 180 CE like Garstad says he could have done. So what gives? Well, it turns out that Mueller's argument is based on a certain interpretation of a comment by the early 3rd century writer Tertullian. A similar interpretation is found in Sidney Thelwall's translation of Tertullian, where Josephus is described as a critic of Thallus. Unfortunately, Thelwall's translation seems to be rather free in that spot, and so we might want to consult the more literal translation by the late Terrett Glover. He was a Cambridge University lecturer of classical literature. Glover's translation is given here, quote, We should have to summon their fellow citizens through whom this knowledge is furnished to us. Add their followers Ptolemy of Mendes, King Yuba, Appion, Thallus, and any other who confirms or refutes them. The Jew, Josephus, native champion of Jewish antiquities, must be consulted, and the Greek books of origins to elucidate the figures in our annals." Unquote. Mueller apparently interpreted this passage to mean that Josephus knew about Thallus's writings, but as we can plainly see, that's not what Tertullian actually says. And it's not just Glover whose translation disagrees with Mueller's interpretation. Out of four different English translations of Tertullian's Apology, only Thelwall's translation turns Josephus into a direct critic of Thallus. And so it looks like this part of Mueller's argument doesn't hold up very well. But Mueller does have one more argument. Remember that he wants to connect Thallus to the Roman Emperor Tiberius, who reigned from 14 to 37 CE. And to see how this connection is supposed to work, we can turn to the late German theologian Emil Schurer. Quote, it may be possible to identify him with a Samaritan Thallus, whom Josephus may have mentioned as a freedman of Tiberius, who once loaned a large sum of money to Agrippa when the latter was in debt, unquote. Well, right away we can see this is a very tenuous connection. For instance, the late Belgian scholar Ida Mavis observed that, quote, the identification of Thallus of Josephus with the historian Thallus is far from certain. The name Thallus was not uncommon at this time, and the Thallus of whom Josephus would speak would have been a moneylender rather than an historian, unquote. And it gets even worse because, as we're about to see, Josephus probably never even mentioned anyone by the name of Thallus. The key line appears in Book 18 of Josephus' Antiquities, quote, Now there was, in addition, a certain man of Samaritan origin who was a freedman of the emperor, unquote. Mueller thought that certain man was none other than Thallus. But why would he think that? Well, to answer that question, we need to look at the original Greek text of Josephus. Ooh, and, oh boy. So, I put this in my script to read aloud, and I don't speak Greek at all. But you know what? I'm going to do it. Kai on gar allos samerios genos kaiseros. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Uh, well, at any rate, the important thing is that phrase, Allos Samarios, means something like another Samaritan. And a difficulty in interpreting it in context led the late classicist John Hudson to speculate that maybe Allos originally read Thalos. Religious studies professor Reinhard Plummer explains, quote, The phrase Allos Samarios has puzzled scholars at least since the 7th century, because no other is mentioned in the text. In 1720, Hudson amended the phrase, therefore, and read Thalos instead of Allos. Unquote. In other words, the text of Josephus, as we actually have it, doesn't say anything about Thallus. It's only speculation on the part of John Hudson that maybe the text is corrupted in that place and originally included the name of Thallus. As Paul Christensen puts it, quote, the other Thallus exists only through emendation, unquote. And accordingly, this emendation has faced a good deal of skepticism. Hudson apparently thought the wording of the Greek was awkward, which is why he made his change, but other scholars disagree. For instance, the late professor of history of religion, Horace Rigg, takes the view that the Greek is just fine the way it is. He says, quote, I don't think the text is corrupt. It's not necessary to alter allos in order to save either the Greek or the sense. Allos is, in my opinion, perfectly sound, unquote. And the late classical scholar Louis Feldman agreed with Rigg's judgment, quote, Rigg does well in keeping the manuscript reading Allos, which he is translated as a pronoun, another, unquote. And also, let's remember that even if the scholars are right to suspect that the text of Josephus has been corrupted, well, that doesn't help us figure out what it originally said that was different. Hudson's emendation to Thallus was based on the fact that it's only one letter away from Allos, and there's at least one person associated with a later emperor by that name. Emil Schurer explains, quote, In favor of identification with Josephus's Samaritan Thallus is the fact that the name occurs many times on Roman inscriptions among the employees of Claudius's house, unquote. So apparently, since the Emperor Claudius reigned from 41 to 54 CE, not too long after Tiberius, Hudson thought that the hypothetical freedman Thallus might also have been the same as a certain man named Thallus employed by Claudius. And Hudson cited this particular inscription here in the slide as an example. If this doesn't strike you as very strong evidence, you're not alone. For instance, in the opinion of the late New Testament scholar Hans Windich, quote, the identification of Thallus with the Samaritan of Josephus doesn't exactly rest on a secure foundation, unquote. And in fact, there are different ways of trying to correct the text. For instance, Ida Mavis suggests a completely different emendation. She says, quote, Considering that the correction Thallus isn't sufficiently founded, we propose to read Anthropos, unquote. I also need to talk about one other proposed solution, which we sometimes hear about, but which probably isn't correct. Horace Rigg mentions it in his paper, quote, In the notes of Gravius, there is the suggestion that since not only Thallus, but Hallus is found, that is to say found in the inscriptions at Claudius' house, this latter might be connected with Josephus, unquote. The late Professor Rigg is referring to the 17th century classical scholar Johann George Gravius, who followed the German archaeologist, and please forgive me for what I'm about to say, Marquard Goud. Goud suggested that the inscription of Thallus we saw a moment ago should instead be rendered as Hallus. And Gravius furthermore noticed that if the aspiration diacritic in the Greek word allos had been changed in Josephus, it could have originally had this alternative name, Hallus. As Gravius writes in the notes to the inscription, quote, The stone itself has properly Hallus. It seems entirely to be Hallus, the freedman of Emperor Tiberius, whom Josephus calls Allos. Unquote. Unfortunately, it looks like Goode's reading of the inscription as Hallus instead of Thallus may not be very well accepted among archaeologists. The apparatus to the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum is especially blunt in its disapproval. Quote, Hallus, Goode's reading, wrongly, unquote. 
And so since Gravius' solution depends on Goode's reading, it looks like it's probably not correct. And I guess I will say that, in my opinion, I like Riggs' solution the best, to just leave Josephus' text as it is in the manuscripts. Even so, none of this is to say that one of Riggs or Mavis's or even Gravius's solutions must be correct and that Hudson's is wrong. Maybe the text of Josephus really did originally read Thallus instead of Allus. But the problem is, whichever solution we decide is most preferable, we still won't have any decisive evidence to say one way or the other. As Hans Windich reminds us, Thallus and Josephus is only old conjecturing. Okay, so I think that about sums up my discussion of Phlegon and Thallus. Hopefully now it's clear that neither one of them, neither Phlegon nor Thallus, is helpful for studying the historical Jesus, nor did they even tell us anything about the development of the gospel tradition. I did very much enjoy researching them, and Phlegon seems like an especially interesting character, but in my opinion, they're just not very relevant when it comes to biblical studies. And ordinarily, I would end the video here, but something was still bothering me after I did this research. You may have noticed it's not just Christian apologists I've been criticizing today. There are plenty of qualified, credentialed biblical scholars, historians, and classicists who've repeated some of this, well, what I would consider to be misinformation. Not so much about Phlegon, but plenty of misinformation about Thallus. So, what's going on here? Uh, why is this happening? Well, I think there are multiple factors at play. In the case of Karl Mueller, he may have simply been overwhelmed by the scope of his work. The classical philologist Conrad Bursian explains, quote, In five substantial volumes, initially supported by his brother Theodore, he then alone collected the fragments of the Greek historians from the oldest so-called logographers up to the time of the Byzantine emperor Constantine VII, transcribed into Latin and accompanied by biographical and bibliographical notes on the individual authors, unquote. I mean, that's a huge project, and such an undertaking almost necessarily invites some kind of human error. The historian Joseph Skinner, for instance, remarked that the final product possessed numerous shortcomings. And later, Felix Jacobi attempted a similar project based on Mueller's foundational work. Not surprisingly, he also made mistakes. Benjamin Garstad puts it like this, quote, Although Jacobi's commentary treatment of his fragments is most often sound, because of the sheer magnitude of his project, he didn't have time for close and extensive analysis of each author. He missed things, unquote. On the other hand, sometimes the fault really does lie with the historian's own inattention. So, for instance, as Garstad points out, quote, Due to some careless oversight, the erroneous assertion that the chronographia of Africanus of 220 or 221 marks the earliest mention of Thallus has been perpetuated in the scholarly literature. The first testimonial to Thallus actually occurs 40 years earlier in the Ad Autolicum of Theophilus, written in 180, unquote. In my opinion, though, probably the most egregious example of neglect when it comes to Thallus scholarship appears in the evangelical biblical scholar Craig Blomberg's book, The Historical Reliability of the Gospels. There, Blomberg claims that Thallus provides brief, independent testimony to Jesus' existence. And he also claims that Thallus wrote in the first century. He gives no argument or reference for either of these claims. He does mention that the fragments of Thallus can be found in one of Jacobi's volumes, but then he admits that Jacobi is, quote, not accessible to me, unquote. Well, that is a shame, because then Blomberg might have realized that, as Jacobi tells us, Thallus first appears in the 2nd century AD, and that this notion that Thallus mentioned Jesus or anything else about Jewish history is, as Jacobi puts it, quite doubtful. Now, Blomberg is an extreme example, and usually scholars aren't nearly that irresponsible. It's worth remembering that historians who study the ancient world face an enormous problem in trying to reconstruct the past with a comparably small amount of evidence, and so they inevitably have to rely on speculation sometimes. As the professor of Greek literature Robert Fowler reminds us, quote, 
Every historian must fill in the gaps in the evidence by surmise and conjecture, unquote. But historians also have to exercise great caution, because if those conjectures are attractive enough, it may be too easily forgotten that their invention is permitted by evidence we don't have and not supported by evidence we do have. And so, for instance, when Ida Mavis rejected John Hudson's emendation of Josephus, she noted that it had nonetheless, quote, seduced eminent scholars, no doubt because of its ingenuity, unquote. Exacerbating the problem is that we hardly know anything about Thallus. As Paul Christensen bluntly admits, much of Thallus's biography depends on a web of speculation, as he puts it. And of course, this isn't exactly a recipe for careful scholarship. Horace Rigg describes the problem as he sees it, quote, Attempts have been made to fix the identity of Thallus because of its potential significance for the early history of the gospel tradition. One of these attempts has become rather popular. Much of the acclaim would seem to be based on a confusion between what has been said about Thallus and what's actually known about him. Consequently, numerous errors of fact and fancy have arisen, unquote. And by the way, I feel a little bit self-conscious about criticizing these scholars. I mean, I'm not a historian, and it takes enough work just doing all the research for these YouTube videos. I can't imagine the kind of time and effort that goes into real historical scholarship. But if I'm going to call it as I see it, well, it sure looks like neither Phlegon nor Thallus are helpful for learning about the historical Jesus, or for studying the development of the gospel tradition. Now, when it comes to Phlegon, it seems like most biblical scholars do agree with me on that. As Dale Allison quips, quote, Phlegon's name has rightly dropped out of the commentaries, unquote. As for Thallus, I'll leave you all with the words of Benjamin Garstead, quote, There's only so much that we can know of Thallus and his work. Our data can take us only so far before we rely wholly on conjecture, and Thallus's name becomes nothing more than a repository for our learned fantasies. Mm -hmm.